what's in your hand? Clearly, that question penetrated Moses, and he saw in an instant when God asked him, what was in your hand? My support, my indispensable tool, the one thing that I cannot do without. And God says, throw it down. Welcome to the worship service of the Capitol Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church, where Dr. Gene Donaldson is the senior pastor. We're located at 914 Massachusetts Avenue Northeast in Washington, D.C. We invite you to worship with us live each and every Saturday morning at one of our two worship services. Our morning manna service begins at 9 a.m. and our divine worship service again at 11 a.m. For more information, you can visit us at our website, www.chcsda.org. Presenting God's Word today, our senior pastor, Dr. Gene Donaldson, his message is titled, What's in your hand? Our hymn of meditation is brought to us by the Capitol Hill Chorale under the direction of Ramon Bryant. The song's entitled, Even Me. The worship service is already in progress. Today's message was recorded on January 11th, 2014.
Ah, mama. I wonder if the choir would let us sing with them. Just one, one round. Come on, everybody. Come on now. Amen. Amen. We certainly want to thank the choir for reminding us uh, who we serve. Isn't God a mighty God? Come on, put your hands together and give him a hand clap. Amen. 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 Shall we bow our heads? Our Father and our God, we're grateful today for your watch care. Each one of us senses beyond a shadow of a doubt the core meaning of that song and how more than anything Every one of us wants those drops to fall on us. We're like what the sound songwriter said. While on others thou art falling. Whatever you do, do not pass us by. And so now, Lord, we pause just for a moment and we ask that you would again honor us uh, from your word. There's only one problem. Your goodness and graciousness from your word must somehow pass through human lips. And so we ask that you would perform a miracle. May the Jesus of the printed page become alive right before our eyes. And may each one of us leave with our own personal benediction. Even me, Lord. Even me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our preaching portion today is taken from a familiar part of the uh, scriptural lore. It's found in that book of Exodus, the fourth chapter. And uh, <clears throat> it centers on uh, verses two through five. You know the background to the story. Moses is on the backside of the Sinai Mountains and there he encounters something that is strange, a bush that is burning, but it has not burned up. And Moses approaches that bush, and he has an encounter with God, and God begins to outline his plans uh, for Moses. 
The interesting thing, brothers and sisters, as we examine our preaching portion this morning, is that by the time of our text, uh, Moses is 80 years old. He has spent the first 40 years of his life next in line to the most powerful man in the civilized world at that time in Egypt. But now he is spending his second 40 years in the self-imposed ranks of a shepherd, uh, one of the lowest jobs that one could be engaged in during his time. God has visited him and in this encounter with God, God has said some words to Moses that Moses did not want to hear or thought he would never hear. God had declared to Moses that it was his divine purpose that after a 40 year hiatus, that he wanted Moses to go back to Egypt back to the place that he had run away from in order to tell Pharaoh a specific message that God would give to Moses and to say to God's people that it was time to pack their bags and to tell Pharaoh to his face, let my people go. And Moses has responded after encountering God, who am I that I could go on this mission? You know why I am here for the last 40 years. You know that I have been relegated to the lowest station in life, walking behind sheep. He says, what qualifies me? Why would you choose me? Who am I that I should go? And God assuages his reluctancy by saying to Moses those very precious words that, that he tells each one of us when, when we're in a quagmire in our lives. He, he says to Moses, I will be with you. Now that should have been enough, but when you been somewhere on the backside for 40 years, that's not enough for you. And so Moses inquires of God, in whose name should I address the people? With my past record with them, they won't believe me. To which God responds, tell them whatever they need has sent you. Tell them the great I am, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has ordered your steps. Tell them that I am here to answer their prayers. I have heard their moanings and groanings, but Moses is still not sold on God. And so he says, Behold, they will not hearken to my voice, for they will say that the Lord has not appeared unto you. And it is in response to this third excuse posed by Moses that God uses a different strategy with his recalcitrant servant. Instead of reassuring Moses with his promise, Chapter 4, where our text is, God uses a different strategy and he endows Moses with the power to perform signs and wonders. Now, your antennas, if you are a Bible student, ought to go up because this is supremely interesting because it is the first recorded time in Scripture where God uses signs and wonders to validate the fact that he is dependable. And our narrative focuses on the first sign of validation. God says to Moses, I've said to you, 
I will be with you. That wasn't enough. I've said to you, tell them that whatever they need, the great I am has sent you. That is enough. He says, all right, Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses sheepishly responds, it's my shepherd's staff. And God says, don't miss it, it's right there in the text. God says to Moses, throw it down. Did you get it? This is not just a stick that Moses picked up to play with. It is not just a walking stick for an 80-year-old senior citizen. It was not just something convenient to lean on after a hard day's work on the backside of a mountain. In a real sense, that staff that God told him to throw down, that rod, represented his livelihood. For a shepherd used his staff as a tool in many important ways. The crooked end of the staff helped him to pull back sheep that, that had strayed away from the herd. The, 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 the rod was a, a handy extension of the shepherd's arm, allowing him to be able to grab things beyond his normal reach. The, the blunt end of the rod was used to fend off the attack of wild animals by poking them away. The staff was very effective against robbers. It could be wielded in a moment's notice like a baseball bat to back off any offender. The rod was essential to the shepherd's success. It could mean the difference between not only making a living as a shepherd, but staying alive. Shepherds would sleep with their rods in their hands. And no shepherd would ever dare leave home without his staff. But God said to Moses, throw it down. Get rid of it. And there is no indication at this point in the narrative that God's command is not permanent. He might not get to use it again. And it was a good rod. It was broken in just right after 40 years. It had the right grip and flex. It, it, it had the right balance when he swung it. And, and, and what about all those fond memories that that rod represented? The wild animals that he had fought off and the sheep that he had rescued. And what about the comfort it gave him as, as he trusted his weight upon that rod after twisting his ankle uh, months ago? Or, or, or the fact that 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 rod had been with him, had it represented 40 years of his life's history. Yeah, he could buy a new one or cut a new rod, but it wouldn't be the same as the one that he had for 40 years. What's in your hand? Clearly, that question penetrated Moses and he saw in an instant when God asked him what was in your hand my support my indispensable tool the one thing that I cannot do without and God says throw it down God was asking Moses to throw down the one possession that was most important to him. And if God had asked him to throw down his tunic or his cloak or a few coins or never put back on his sandals, it would have not been as challenging as giving up that staff. To throw down his rod meant he was leaving himself completely vulnerable in the desert where ravenous animals and unscrupulous poachers thrive. Now hear this. Now if you miss anything else I say today, don't miss this. The incredible fact 
of the whole narrative, the reason that it is written in your Bible, the reason that God pushes his faith to this point, the reason that we have this recorded in chapter 4, for the record says, when God asked him, what's that in your hand? That Moses cast down his rod to the ground and he does it immediately. Moses doesn't hesitate. All of the excuses that he had gave when God first approached him, when God asked him to throw it down, Moses doesn't hesitate. No, Lord, I depend on this. No, how am I going to support myself and survive without it? No excuses as he had done when God first anointed him as his incredible and accredited ambassador. By the way, the question ought to be asked while we are here today. What's in your hand? When you really get down to it, what is it that you consider absolutely essential to your well-being? What would be your indispensable staff today? For some, it might be a house, or for others, it might be an expensive automobile, or for some, it might be uh, a job. For some, it might be another human being. But I suspect that if we had to narrow everything down and put some truth serum in every person in here, the bottom line would be that the most important possession that all of us would have would be our money. Touch your neighbor, say the pastor just said something important. Somebody said that money may not be the most important thing, but it sure beats whatever is second best. And if we had to give up all else and begin fresh with only one possession, it would be most likely be our money because money, you can purchase your food, you can sustain yourself, you can clothe yourself, you can house yourself. Money tends to be the one thing that people hold on to tighter than anything else. It is the only thing we have which provides all the necessities and some of the luxuries we need and expect in life. We pay our bills with it. We use it to barter and borrow. We use it to acquire our wants. We use it to take vacations. We use it to invest. We use it to bring joy to other people. We use it to pay tuition. We use it to prepare for retirement. We use it for a myriad of things. We use our money to meet our needs, and we must. We use our money to provide for our kids, and that's admirable. And we use our money to prepare for retirement and rainy days, and we should. But what do you do when God comes to you like he did Moses and asks you to literally sacrifice the most essential tool in your toolkit? What do you do when he says, throw it down for the benefit of the church? You didn't hear me. I'm going to say that again. What do you do? when the call is to throw it down for the benefit of the church. What's in your hand? Is it God's tithe that you failed to return in 2013? What's in your hand? Is it the systematic offering you covenant with God to give, but you cut down the amount because the bills were a little high? Is it 
it is quiet in here. I, I'm, <laughs> I feel like I'm walking th through the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> Could you not watch with me for one hour? <laughs> hey, is it the money you could have sacrificed for the Gideon project? But you didn't because you weren't for the project in the first place? What's in your hand? What is it that in 2014 you are willing to throw down for God? Moses held in his hand his most valuable possession and he dared to throw it down and the thing of the text that is the genius of the text that is really the gem, the diamond in the rough is that when God asked him to throw down the most indispensable thing that he had, he did it immediately without equivocation and without hesitation. And our decision to throw it down, to make the additional sacrifice, to give our money to the purposes of God is the biggest and greatest revelator of your faith and confidence in God. Hear me now. What we do with our money is the greatest indicator of our Christian commitment, even more so than how much time I spend doing church work, other, that's important. Or how many people I visit, that's important. Or how many good deeds that I do, that's important. I'm not, diminu I'm not minimalizing any of those. But never miss Jesus' point. If you want to know really where a person's heart is, observe how they use money. For where the heart is, there will also be the treasure. If you want to know what you really value, what you really believe in, don't play back your tapes. What you really value and what you really believe in, the best indicator is your bank account ledger. What's in your tithe envelope? What's punched if you do it electronically? is a better forecaster of your love for the kingdom. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, would my giving convince anybody that I love the Lord? Moses thought he couldn't do without his staff. But he trusted God and threw it down. The good news today is, how do we know we really can't dig deeper unless we test it and try? And how do we know that we can't afford to increase until we step out and throw down like Moses. Because here's the point, and here's the other genius in the text that you should not miss. Your future, your finances, your well-being in 2014, everything that is you or everything that is destined to be you is in the hands of one person. And his name is not Obama. His name is whatever you need me to be. His name is the great I am. And I came by to tell somebody today 
you are not in control. You have never been in control. You never will be in control. You never could be in control. You never should be in control. Because it is by the mercies of God that we live and move and have our beings. It is God that sets things up and takes it down. God is the only one that can make a crooked stick straight. And it is God, and it is God alone that is in control. Perhaps the quintessential Old Testament story illustrating the principle that I'm trying to share today is the story of Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. God asked Abraham to sacrifice that which was most dear to him, the promised heir, Isaac. And like Moses on the backside of a mountain, Abraham obeyed. And the thing that is consistent about all of these people, these Old Testament um, uh, patriarchs and friends of God, is that whenever God asks, they do it immediately. Did you notice? God said, throw it down. Moses threw it down. Abraham obeyed, even though he didn't understand, without hesitation, and a great nation came into be. Abraham did not understand how he could kill the promise and yet still receive the promise, but he obeyed. Likewise, brothers and sisters, you can't understand how you can return one-tenth, then give a systematic, liberal, coveted offering out of the remaining nine-tenths, and yet God could bless you to do more with what's left than you could do if you had kept all ten-tenths. You can't understand uh, that any more than Moses or Abraham did before. But they understood the principle when you're in relationship with God. When God says it, do it. Obey and watch God do it. Because when you obey what God says immediately, God becomes responsible for you. God asked Moses to give up and throw down his most valuable possession. In effect, he asked Moses to give up his security. And Moses did. And when he did, God blessed him. That rod was never the same after Moses picked the rod back up. God tested Abraham to see if he would really trust God, even in an impossible circumstances. And Abraham passed the test. Abraham said, if God said it, I'm going to do it, even though I don't understand it. In fact, I have never seen a person resurrected. But if God said it, somebody's going to get up out the grave. God tested Moses to see if he would trust God. Even in that absurd circumstances, and Moses did. See, what I'm trying to get you to see today, brothers and sisters, as we start off 2014, is that trusting in God is a matter of immediate obedience to whatever God requests, even if it seems impossible and absurd. Hear me now. It is not trust when you feel like it and obey when you can. It is not trust then obey when you run out of all other options. The songwriter got it right. Trust and obey. Trust rightly understood is really a 
indirect, subtle command. Look what happened to Moses when he released his staff to God. With that same rod that for 40 years helped him dodge sheep poop. Now that rod was used to part the Red Sea. That same rod that was used for 40 years trying to get sheep off of the crevice of a rock, that rod was used to strike a rock and bring water forth. With that rod, Moses oversaw the conquest of the enemies of Israel and led a people to the borders of the promised land. The psalmist says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Here it is. For God's rod and staff comfort and protect me. Did you get it? You give up your rod, you get God's rod. You missed it. Moses feared no evil. Because when you put trust in God, he throws down his own rod, his own security, and he exchanged it for God's rod of protection and security. And what I'm trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, in 2014, or before we get into this year, God's got plans for each one of us. And they're tests to see if we can be trusted. He's going to test each individual. He's going to test our church. And we have marching orders. And it will be clear what God wants us to do. And the question is, can he get us to throw down? Are we willing to give back our most prized possession? His money disguised in your pocket so that he could accomplish his purpose. What could happen? That sounds like my grandson. <laughs> what could happen if we all decided as one to throw down our money. And use it for the glory of God. What could happen if each one of us with tear-stained eyes said, Lord, I wish I could give you another dollar I'll tell you what could happen. We may not part the Red Sea, but we could get that multi-purpose facility. We could feed some kids. We could mend some broken hearts. We could set some captives free. We could give some sight to the spiritual brown. We may not be able to strike water from the rock, but we could help, help a whole lot of people find the promised land of salvation and fellowship and Christian education. We may, may not be able to con um, conquer all of the systematic enemies of our community. But we could make a serious dent in the devil's playhouse and help some prodigal people get a new start. And we can do it if more than 30% throw it down. When Moses threw down his rod, he did not know what to expect. 
But when God allowed him to pick it back up, Moses performed miracles that are remembered throughout history. And we tell the stories and sing the songs about the glory that Moses used with that rod. But it all started when Moses decided to trust God and throw it down. And when we trust God enough to throw it down, here's what happens. We become agents for God's miracles and blessings. And here's the point that you should always remember. Whatever you do for God's cause, God must find a way to do more for you. Because it is an impossible for God to be in your debt. You will never give more to God than God will give to you. Because it is impossible for him to be in your debt. Ah, one of my favorite stories is about a little teenage boy who stood up in church after hearing a sermon on stewardship like this. And uh, he was much more enthusiastic and he said, I get it. I finally get it. I finally see it after all these years. It's not how much of my money I give to God. It's how much of God's money I use for myself. I'll never forget uh, when Donaldson and I were on vacation in Italy. Uh, we visited a beautiful um, countryside villa. It was like a monastery, but it had um, olive uh, groves and beautiful gardening, etc. And I remember complimenting the trusted gardener who at uh, maintain the grounds. And uh, I said to him, I, the owner must, uh, he must come here real frequently because, I mean, this place is immaculate. He must check up on you all of the time. To which the gardener said in uh, his uh, piece of English, he said, matter of fact, I have never seen the owner in my life. Now that really sparked my curiosity, you know, and then I responded. So I, I asked him, how do you get your orders to, 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 to know how to keep this so beautiful and everything? And he pride, he said, the, the, the owner has an agent who lives in Milan. And I said, well, if the owner doesn't come, maybe the agent must come down here often to inspect what you're doing. And he said, no, he said, the agent comes down maybe once a year or so. And I was amazed and I said to myself and I said to him, you mean to tell me that essentially nobody is supervising you for the whole year, yet these grounds are impeccable, they are beautiful to sight and to all that you're doing, it is almost as if you are doing it as if you expect the owner to come tomorrow. And he looked at me and he exclaimed and he got all excited and jumped up and down and he said in his broken English, I beg your pardon. Not tomorrow, but today. I act like the God of the owner is coming back today. And that's why I take care of his business. The gardener was faithful to his trust. And what was in his hand to do, he did it. And the question for us is what's in your hand? David said, all I've got is a slingshot. And God said, we'll use that slingshot 
to bring down that 12 foot uncircumcised heathen. Samson said, all I've got is the jawbone of an ass. We'll use it to slay Philistines. John and James say, all we've got of our net and cast your net and while you're doing it, I'll make you fishermen of men. Moses said, all I've got is a rod. He says, well, take it down to the Red Sea and watch it part. Little lad said, all I've got is five barley bread and two fish the size of a sardine. God said, use it and give it. And I'll feed 5,000 and still give them enough to take home for tomorrow's lunch. A widow said, all I've got is two mice. Put it in the treasure and let Jesus brag about you. Mary said, all I've got is an alabaster box. He said, pour it out. And as long as the gospel is preached, January 11, 2014, Gene Donaldson will be talking about you. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? His money. His money. His money. His money. And the only command that we have in scripture is throw it down. Throw it down. And if we throw it down, all we will be doing in 2004 is putting ourselves in position for miracles. Your head's about. Father, we pause just for a moment. And perhaps we reflect upon our own rods and staff. Each one of us wants to make ourselves a committee of one to put ourselves into position to be receivers of your blessings. And what you've asked us to do is return a faithful tithe because that doesn't even belong to us. And we don't want stealing to be placed by our names. But help us out of the other nine tenths, and you know all of the obligations that we have and many of them are just obligations and it is your desire and will for us to take care of our daily sustenance, to invest, to put something away for emergency, to take care of all of the things that we should do. But what we're really praying for today, Lord, is out of the nine tenths that you graciously allow us to make decisions on, help us in the midst of enjoying your blessings and whatever you have provided to carve out something out of that nine tenths that we can cover to give systematically to you. Not because you mandate it, but because we want to thank you for all of your blessings. In other words, Lord, help us to throw down in 2014 like we never have before. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of this economic crisis, that as a collective body, we were able to have 
more tithe than we did the last year before. That's a direct blessing from you. But help each one of us to covenant within our own spirit to say this year, I'm going to do something that represents my best for God, whatever it is. And for those who may not have employment or means, may they pray about what they would do if they could do so that they can be credited also. Help us, Lord, to like that gardener. To treat your business like it is so utmost important as if you were coming today, not tomorrow, today. And may each one of us respond like Moses and Abraham immediately when you place before us the challenge. Immediately. Let us not worry about what the next person is doing, but let us search our own hearts and see individually what it is that I can do myself and make myself a committee of one to not be satisfied unless I can say at the end of this year, I have done my best. That's all God requires. I have done my best. And whether that best represents 50 cents, if I do my best for God, it is as if I have given more than the entire kingdom itself. Now bless each person within the sound of my voice. Bless them immeasurably. Penetrate our minds with the, the awesome understanding that there is no way, no how, no way that you can beat God giving. No matter how hard we try. And now, Lord, perhaps there is someone here today. who this message is one step in advance. For this is a message for disciples, people who already are part. Or perhaps there's some man, woman, boy, or girl here today who has not taken that initial step, the step where they allow you to come into the house have a conversation. You exchange some gifts. They give you all of their sins and you give them all of your righteousness. They've been hanging on the peripheral. But now you've invited them to be a part of your church. We pray in a very special way today. And we open up the doors of this church. Some man, woman, boy, or girl who may be here today, not a part of this fellowship, but like these two precious souls that went out into the baptismal pool or Sister Stennis who joined by profession of faith, they want to say to the Lord and Savior to Christ, Lord, this is my day too. I want to do what the pastor is talking about, but I've got to take care of first business first. I've got to get on the team I've got to get in the huddle and so if you're here today not a member of the church the Lord is speaking to you you like to be simply raise your hand I will see your hand but more importantly God will see your heart anyone here today wants to take that initial step that says Lord I'm on your side Father, thank you again for the example of Moses. And may each one of us experience your miracle working power 
All because when you came to us and asked us what's in our hand, and we threw it down. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen.